thank you um, so much, Homera. And I also share the same thoughts as everyone that this is an important summit because these conversations are extremely important to for the way forward, especially after the pandemic. We have a lot of insightful conversations in politics, inclusive policy making, disaster response systems. Our panel is on the skills, innovation, and the future of work. And it's very important because uh, the uh, reconstruction of the soul key uh, it's somehow because you're the, you're the economic empowerment of women and the way they feel about themselves is, is linked. So here is our Oskyopar session. Hai, and whether Pakistani women, women in Punjab, they have the right skills and opportunity to be a part of the workforce and former labor market. We have a very esteemed panel with us today to talk about this. Uh, Mr. Faisal Bari, who is an Associate Professor of Economics at NAMS. He's also a Senior Research Fellow at Ideas Pakistan and has served as Deputy Country Director for Pakistan with Central Eurasia Project and an Education Economist for South Asia Dopen Society Foundation. Really passionate about the work that he does, especially on female force participation in the labor force participation. And also he's um, the former Executive Director and current uh, Visiting Research Fellow at Mehbibul Haq Human Development Center. Thank you so much, Faisal Saab, for joining us. Uh, next, we have Usman Khan, who is a skills investment climate as well as policy expert. For over 20 years, he has worked on various strategies and policies. Some of these include provincial growth strategies for Punjab, a private sector development strategy for Punjab, co-author Balochistan and Punjab investment policies, national SME policy, national industrial policy 2011, and several others. He works on innovation and under an FCDO funded program is leading work on innovation and action research to create uh, institutions and systems which can actually support uh, apart from other things, gender responsive planning and budgeting. Usman has also served extensively with pri private sector value chains across the country and in Nigeria, and has provided substantial inputs on skills, land, and regulatory reforms. Thank you, Usman, for joining us. Then we have Shamim Rajani, who is a vice president uh, of PASHA, which is a Pakistan Software Housing Association and a vice chairperson of Pasha. She's a, techno, a techpreneur as uh, somebody in technology entrepreneur should be called and has been serving the Pakistan IT industry for the last 15 years. She is a CEO at Gentech uh, Solutions, which is a software company dedicated to provide end-to-end -end IT solutions and services to global audience. She is also the founder of ConcelNet, which is a tech training incubator that imparts technology training on social grounds, especially for women. Thank you to our esteemed panel. I, I would begin with Dr. Faisal Bari. Faisal sir, we have seen that a large number of women in Pakistan are in the informal sector with sometimes little or no compensation. COVID, it has done extensive damage to the labor force, especially impacting women. You have recently worked on a research regarding it. What are the numbers like? Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone, and uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, so the way we looked at informal sector was um, uh, the way uh, Pakistan Bureau of Statistics defines it, less than 10 employees, micro and home based. Um, and we were, um, I mean, just to, before I start, let me just say that 72% um, of our employment is the in the informal sector, which is the 72% uh, of non-agriculture related employment is informal. And of the women working, almost 71.8 odd percent work in the informal sector. So the majority of women who work in Pakistan work in the informal sector. When I say work, I'm talking basically of paid work, not of the work that is done in the household. Um, that's another debate we can uh, at some point come to, but uh, just talking about the paid work. Um, and in these 71 percent, 78 odd percent of women work, uh, working in rural sectors and 67 percent of urban uh, women working in urban sectors are in the informal sector. So what we, when you talk about informal sector, you're talking about basically most of the women working in Pakistan. Uh, 
Um, and most of these jobs, if you look at, say, uh, labor force survey, which is where we got our basic numbers from before we went in and did a survey, uh, our own survey, uh, that um, the um, most of them work in certain sectors, not all. They are represented, agriculture, obviously, as uh, Hadi also said, agriculture is a big sector. But then services, a uh, service sector is, is fairly large in that as well. And that's various kinds of services that are provided in both urban and rural areas. Um, so when you're looking at trying to reach women working in the informal sector, it's important to go um, through these subsectors and then try to reach to women who are informal in the informal sector and therefore are harder to reach than, um, say, if you were doing surveys in uh, places of work, etc. Now, during COVID, uh, what we found uh, in our surveys was essentially something that has been talked about a little in the previous sessions as well. Um, job loss, either temporary or permanent, reduced hours of work, um, reduced salaries, delays in salaries, uh, job switching, quite a bit of job switching happened over the COVID period and still continuing. People either were fired from their jobs, were not able to manage them or uh, continue with them, had reduced hours, had to take second jobs, had to move jobs to be able to make a certain sum of money, uh, move sectors sometimes because one sector was hit harder than the other. And so um, there's a lot of job switching that also happened um, over this period. Um, most households, um, so this I'm talking within the work, workplace and marketplace. Then at home, the biggest changes were, or biggest impacts were um, on the time of women. Uh, so majority of housework, care for children and care for the elderly fell disproportionately on the women. And so their time allocation at home increased substantially. This is true not only of the shutdown period, but has been true after shutdown, even in the um, semi, when, when businesses started opening, though they haven't gone to the full tilt yet, but even during that period, the increased responsibilities at home and a differential impact on time is there for uh, compared to men. This is also true for girls. This is also, and which has then the subsequent effect that it might mean more of a learning loss for girls than boys in education, a higher potential dropout rate in education as well. But we'll come to that maybe later um, in, 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 when we are in the discussion uh, mode. Um, so um, a tremendous income shock, employment shock of various, as I said, of various things within that. And therefore, coping mechanisms that we found largely were um, a significant uh, belt tightening. So almost every household we talked to had to reduce expenditures significantly wherever they could. And in this case, it meant in many ways uh, what we would consider essential expenditure on health and education and a number of other things as well, sometimes even food um, mm. uh, inf informally cutting down on food intake to try to manage uh, with disrupted, lower or infrequent, um, um, less uh, predictable income flows. And remember, uh, informal sector, as people have said, because of the low salaries, the no protection, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, already vulnerable. So this created, uh, this increased the vulnerability substantially. Uh, the second way they coped was by borrowing. So almost all the uh, women we talked to, and we talked about 1,100 plus women in the informal sectors in Sindh and Punjab, largely Sindh and Punjab, uh, all of them, almost all of them pointed out that their household went into debt over this period. The debt could be substantial or small, but it was, the, most of them went into debt and most of them borrowed largely from their uh, family and relatives and other friends to the extent they could, but used any other source that they could find in even in terms of maxing out uh, credit cards, et cetera, et cetera. Now that debt overhang is going to continue beyond the shutdown, obviously, and as incomes come back, but since the incomes are coming back slowly and sometimes incomes are not enough to save, which is why they initially had to go into debt, this problem of debt overhang is going to be with these families for quite some time. 
Does that require one-time transfers or any other thing uh, from the state to deal with it? Well, that's a policy issue we'll come back to um, in at some point. Um, I do, do want to talk about um, something which I'll pick up later okay, because um, I think we'll come to uh, what it means for the future of work. But yeah. we did ask businesses, where, this is the last point I'll make, we did ask businesses very, very specifically, what has changed for you, even uh, when you came back to business? So, And many of them said that their business model has had, an, uh, had a, they have had a rethink about that. And what that has meant is sometimes they've changed their products. Sometimes they have reconfigured the services that they offer. Sometimes they have also uh, gone, uh, a lot of them have gone online, digitized their businesses mm -hmm. and using mobile phones a lot more. Yeah. And that all of those will have an impact on the shape of the market, but we'll come back to that in a later discussion. Maybe yeah. I can start telling you that. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Faisal Saab. You actually pointed uh, to this point about women uh, in the informal sector and then especially being impacted by uh, COVID very badly. Usman, we even before COVID, uh, we did we ha we've seen that you know women are a part of the informal sector because they lack the requisite skills to be a part of the formal sector at times and opportunities, of course. So when we talk about the skills gap. Uh, especially for women, uh, what is that, and what how what are the numbers that 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 makes it so you know um, disappointing? Um, thank you. Uh, just adding on to what uh, Faisal said earlier, uh, uh, can you allow me to share the screen? For some reason, I can't share my screen. Is, is yeah, they'll make you the co-host. Yeah. Anyway, I'll 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 continue. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, if we just draw down some of the numbers from from the labor force survey, um, you know, the two comparator points is the last one was done in 2017-18, and the previous one was done in 2014. The uh, the the you know the the participation of uh, especially in the young. So I'm talking now age group between uh, 10 to 24. Uh, because that's where you know skills become most most relevant. Uh, if you look at the trends between the last seven, eight, six, five years, the participation of women, especially young young women and girls, have actually fallen in uh, in the labor force. One of one of that area is linked to limited opportunities, you know, limit, especially limited economic opportunities. Uh, partly, it is to do with uh, with skills. Uh, an, an important indicator that we look at that uh, in, in this particular element is uh, the a number called NEET, which is the neither in employment, education, or training. Uh, now, 21.6 percent of, of women. You can share your screen, Osman, now if you want to. Okay. It's been an effort. I think it's still giving me some problems. I'll just I'll just talk about the numbers. I think so. If you look at it, about twenty one point six percent of uh, women between the girls between the age of ten to twenty four are neither in education, employment, or any form of training, as compared to only ten point eight percent of men. Uh, so that means, in essence, we are actually not only the women are contributing less, but there are lesser opportunities for training as well uh, when we talk about women. Uh, but looking at it from a um, more from a policy policy orientation point of view and from a debate in terms of you know, empowering women, especially economically, um, I think the issue uh, more to do is with the provision of a control environment where women can actually perform better. You know, our traditional systems actually talk about or focus more on proving performance rather than improving performance. So that means when a woman actually enters a training facility or education, a person would know that much better, or even work for that matter, or entrepreneurship. The, the pressure is that, can I do this better? So, you know, they, they're always looking at under, performing under that uh, pressure to perform rather than, you know, trying to improve their, improve their performance will actually enhance their, enhance their capability. So our, you know, looking at Alice Eagle's uh, social, uh, social role theory, Basically, you know, where gender biological differences define some some roles, and you know, you go by the stereotype uh, uh, approach approach using that. What it lacks is, especially when you talk about our skills, 
is in, in traditional skills that we do not talk about the personal initiative training, which is looking at the behavioral change and actually encouraging women to start being more proactive and more comfortable in the way they can actually begin to contribute. Uh, now, there's a, um, an important study done by World Bank. Uh, they used a randomized controlled trials uh, looking at comparing traditional skills training versus uh, skills training that were based on personal initiative training. Uh, they demonstrated that there was a 40% gain in entrepreneurial profits where a personal initiative training was actually uh, matched with traditional skills. Now, what is personal, personal initiative training? It's basically uh, mentoring women to be, you know, uh, be more the, making a mindset which is more future oriented. It is sort of built on proactivity, responding to challenges rather than just asking them about challenges, making them actually more comfortable. And basically, especially for entrepreneurship, I think we normally talk about very traditional sort of uh, incubation method where, you know, we provide some accounting support, we provide some uh, business development support, but we do not look at uh, how women would perform under pressure in a, in a given business situation or in a given employment situation. Uh, so this this personalized initiative training, which talks about behaviors, actually leave women in in deep waters and then actually encourage them and train them and mentor them to actually swim themselves out. And as a result, it builds that confidence where they're able to actually graduate uh, towards a, a you know a better better outcome. So you know these personal behaviors and initiative training. Uh, really sort of, I think, uh, is the missing link in our traditional skills methodology. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why uh, it's, it's not just, uh, I mean, in, in given in case of Pakistan, the opportunities are fairly limited as well. I mean, you need to understand that historically over the last 70 some odd years, we've only grown at around four and a half percent. And there is a employment elasticity of around 0.5, which means that there have been limited opportunities. Uh, but even in that, the opportunities for women have been limited because this, our, our, our approach to skills training actually lacked that, uh, uh, you know, uh, creating that pathway where women can actually graduate just from just not only getting the technical skills or the technical knowledge, but actually changing those behaviors and cultures where they can actually begin to create that uh, control environment, a bigger control environment where they're able to actually perform. Uh, and I think that has been a missing link where we see a lot of uh, the statistics that Faisal also quoted, a lot of women, uh, well, one, they're the small, the, the size is small. And then secondly, most of them are in the in, informal sectors. Uh, and I'll talk about some of those future work opportunities in the uh, later part. Thank you, Sman. That, that those numbers like are, again, as I said earlier, are disappointing. And I hope that in future, we're able to improve them. My question to Shamim is that um, Faisal Saab also talked about, you know, the mobile ownership and all those things. And we know that uh, the latest GMSA report says that probably Pakistan, new women having ownership of mobile phones is still quite limited and dependent on a lot of social cultural issues. So you work very closely with women in tech and technology. And we all know that you know technology is a game changer for women in Pakistan. Uh, but we've seen that the digital divide is also very real. And um, how are women navigating that to be able to be a part of the workforce? And, uh, and how do they acquire those requisite new skills and innovative skills that we talk about? Right. Uh, thank you, Gulali, uh, for having me here. Uh, I was listening to what uh, Faisal Saab was saying and also what Usman was saying, and I'll come back to that in, in a bit. I just wanted to share some stats, uh, and I totally agree with, uh, you know, what, what Usman was saying is to merge um, skills. It's not just about them not having skills, but also about them um, having the soft skills or the, like he mentioned, personal initiative training associated, you know, linked with uh, giving them the technology skills or the tech skills to be able to uh, and to put their foot into the industry and then have a firm footing and stay there. So some of the things that we did, I will talk to you about later, but uh, uh, if you could move on to the next slide, please. And uh, just skip this one because I think uh, Faisal Saab and Usman have talked a lot about numbers. Let's stay on this slide. Okay, so I'm going to be talking specifically with regard to the technology industry because that's what I represent. So I don't, uh, this, is, this is more of the unconventional industry itself again. Uh, right now where we stand, and this is uh, as per the Gallup survey, which was 2019-2020, 51% of firms exporting IT and 41% of, uh, you know, not exporting uh, IT firms have no women on their workforce. 
um, or um, but we have also so so there is there is the sad affair of things even today in technology where there is uh, such a huge uh, opportunity to work from home remote work we still have we are still struggling so let's not talk about the other industries right now let's let's stick to it for a, for a minute and think about you know where we are right now so that's that's the bigger challenge now given that it has been improving at a, at a pace of 20% growth even being the more more nascent industry in pakistan it has been seeing a 20% growth each year so we know the the opportunities out there having said that women are nowhere to be seen now in terms of diversity um firms that have a um, uh, you know um, uh, more women on board uh, we have seen that only firms that that have a higher revenue uh, you know annual revenue of over 40 million or something you see at least a couple of women there the gender diversity uh, ratio in tech companies even today is 10% the highest that we recorded last year was 27% which is why we moved on to some initiatives which i personally uh, am associated with regard to pasha and other uh, stakeholders so if you could move on to the next slide please and i'll talk a bit about them um so uh, what pasha did and to to basically capture the opportunity that is coming our way post covid so like fasal uh, bari mentioned ke jo dusri industries hain they've sort of like been struggling with uh, uh, unemployment and you know uh, uh, people have uh, uh, women have especially lost their jobs technology has seen a slightly different um, you know curve a curve ball around that because we have actually seen um, uh, things where a work from home has become a norm so uh, pakistan uh, so if i want to hire somebody uh, from within the city i can uh, now now you know a specific area in karachi or a specific area in lahore is not my only geo location i can hire from within lahore from within punjab from within pakistan anywhere because nobody is able to come to work so we have to have that infrastructure in place for them to be able to work from home how that helps women is now i can hire more women because the biggest problem one of the biggest problems that women have is commute right now that commute is out of the way then i can hire a, a fairly bigger talent which includes a more diverse talent right so if people from internal punjab and internal sindh as well as more women so what pasha did uh, during this time uh, uh, is is we did two things so we built a diversity committee and we built a skill development committee and uh, those committees have been working in close liaison with the government to be able to uh, work towards uh, coming up with programs and i'll talk about those later on but some of the programs that i really want to mention that actually align well with the problems that uh, dr faisal has been mentioning and usman has been mentioning is um, code girls code girls is one program where we decided to impart tech training to women girls especially those uh, that did not were not able to complete their uh standard education they were not able to graduate from universities per se bring them into the mainstream but then skill development was not wasn't the only only thing that we taught them we basically uh, tuned it up with entrepreneurship financial literacy workplace harassment and those sort of sorts of things and then also showing them role models in the face women from all over pakistan pakistani women from all over the world who came on board and they basically mentored them so we tied it up and we had amazing results where 50% of these girls were able to um, be employed in companies throughout pakistan similarly yeah. other initiatives like pro women where we um, gathered women from all over pakistan women in cxo positions women who can be good mentors good speakers to be able to um, uh, show it to the world and to pakistan that uh, we do have women in technology that can be um, you know strong players then we created a women in tech pk um, community and this is not when i when i say we i don't mean me i mean a lot of women with coming women together have, everybody coming together to have, support exactly exactly and then uh, this platform is just for mentorship just to help each other just to support each other and this has around 8000 pakistani technologists women technologists from all over the world and uh, this platform has actually done wonders uh, you know when we talk about it in detail other platforms like digital skills techro and many more that are working in silos my thing is that all of these platforms are working but unless and until we work together we collaborate we work yeah. uh, on one wing uh, we cannot i think uh, break uh, break the stereotype we cannot make a bigger difference so um, now coming yeah. back to what 
But since I was saying that 71.8% uh, women work in informal sectors and then, you know, uh, about post COVID in technology domains. Uh, uh, so I, 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 would, I would like to talk more about, uh, you know, post COVID in technology domains, like I said, work from home. And then um, technology domain did, did see a, a bit of a drop when COVID came, but uh, we pivoted very quickly. So, you know, um, um, organizations, technology organizations that were working um, more in uh, sectors that had taken a bigger hit, they moved more towards e-commerce and health and ed tech. And it was easier for us, right, compared to others. Uh, pl plus, um, when the first world uh, uh, countries um, hit an economic um, barrier, they basically moved more towards outsourcing and offshoring. So that actually brought more work to Pakistan, which gave us a bigger opportunity to hire more women in technology. So for, for uh, like for myself only, last year, my um, diversity ratio was um, 26%. This year, um, it has hit, hit a 37%, which, uh, which is surprising to me as well because I had no idea that we were hiring so many women, but we were able to do that. Um, you know, so, yeah. so and then the other part of your so, question, yeah. Yeah, but thank you, Shamim. Those were really um, interesting things because a lot of people now talk about the future of work as being tech-based jobs, right? So it's good that you're being, you know, taking those initiatives to train women. Uh, Faisal mm -hmm. Saab, um, my question to you is that, the, of course, like when we talk about future of work and tech taking up most of the jobs, the problem is that we already are in a crisis where people are struggling to find work. So how do you foresee this vis-a-vis -vis the future of work, especially for women? I think um, where, um, let me just say that where there is a positive that we have seen um, in the sense that, that uh, work is being redefined um, rather than by space, by time and effort in some ways. And so you have the possibility now of remote working much more than before. And we are developing a lot more software um, and hardware that will allow for that to happen as well. So it's the start of this. I mean, think of uh, back in March, I have been teaching for 20 years, yet I had never had a Zoom uh, class or anything. At best, I had been on Skype, basically, and that's a, or on the phone, that's about it. But now I spend about eight to 10 hours a day on Zoom um, or Teams or such platform. And, and the nature of those platforms is evolving and changing fast to allow for breakouts, face-to-face, -face, this, that, the possibilities are quite a bit um, that are still unexplored. And I'm sure the same thing will happen to people, especially who provide intellectual inputs rather, rather than uh, physical, et cetera, for having possibility of uh, uh, home-based work, et cetera. But what I also want to point out is to the other side, um, which is that for the first time, and this is from my work on education, for the first time, I also became amazingly aware or much more aware than before of the diversity in home environments that actually can hamper work as, um, uh, and not just facilitate it, right? So, and this is, again, there's a very strong gender differential uh, here where um, you know, women have, as I said, more responsibility for homework, less physical space. They might have their, their um, uh, online presence is more monitored or at least is more kept an eye on. Whether they are given the same, uh, whether their work is given the same respect or not in a household is important as well. I have colleagues who tell me that when a bell rings outside or anything, it's never my husband or brother who goes to open the door. When both of us are on our respective Zoom meetings, it's always I who have to get up and go. When children need something, it is always I who have to get up and do that rather than my husband or my brother or whoever else um, the male counterparts in that household might be. Now, and that has had tremendous impact, at least in the education field, where we have had many students say that they don't want to work from home. They don't want to study from home. They want to come back to the university. I mean, I teach at the university. Um, they, there's been a tremendous pressure from students to open it up, even with some risks of COVID, et cetera, because home environments do not provide for conducive environment for learning and working. Now, if you move jobs that way, 
I think you will have to be very aware of that kind of differential and the tremendous pressure that can bring on in, in especially women or differentially on women. Um, and I think there will need to be some. The other thing I want to point out in the future of work is yes, I mean, many businesses pointed out much more phone use and much more internet use, hence uh, the infrastructure for both have to be there, phones have to be um, much more uh, available, uh, accessible, um, uh, similarly for iPad, whatever, uh, tablets and um, laptops and so on. But the other side of it also is that, um, uh, that infrastructure and internet connections, of course, but that's the least of our problems. I think the bigger problems come after that, which is that are we in some ways increasing informality even more? Are we going to legislate and go into areas of legislation that says that if a person is working from home, what is the equivalent of a full-time worker in that case? Right. Um, um, how will we treat that work? What is the salary? Is it formal, informal? Will the company show them? And what new laws or new ways of thinking do we need to bring on policy side to ensure that this doesn't mean further erosion of rights of labor, rights of workers, uh, further erosion. I, mean, I say further erosion, protection, protection law in uh, legal terms, we can say that we can do it as we can extend it, but that's work that needs to be done in what is full-time work, what is part-time work, how do we define it, how do we maintain work-life balance? I mean, I'm one victim definitely, but I'm sure most people have felt it, that there yes. is no, no boundaries left between work and life anymore because of this situation of working from home, um, whether it's night or weekend. Ho. Now, all of those then need to be translated into policies and frameworks and law that allows us to think through okay, how to get the benefits that uh, both Usman and Shamim pointed out, but limit or remove the, all the negatives that come with such transitions, etc. Transition to hum nahi rok sakte, wo to honi hai. Wo markets determine karenge, wo cost benefits determine karenge. Lekin, uh, uski asal dusri side liye ke usko phir manage aur usko craft kaise karna hai, wo kaam hamara ho. Yeah. Thank you, Faisal Saab, especially uh, your insight into the fact that even when women have access to technology, unke upar jo checks hain, wo bhoat different kind ke hote hain, aur social cultural pressures bhi bhoat different kinds ke hote hain. Uh, Usman, um, I would rather club uh, two questions for you because we are limit, uh, have a limited time. So I would uh, like to answer you to answer both of them. Uh, you've worked very closely with the industry, and uh, we see that the skill sector, especially in Pakistan, is very supply driven at the moment. So what is the demand from the industry like, especially in terms of skills development? This is one question. And the other thing that I want you to please talk about a little is that we've talked about you know, effective policy measures for uh, enabling uh, young people to enter the market skilled and then having opportunities to jobs also. So what policies do you think need to be put in place, especially you know, knowing and keeping in mind that what work will look like in the future for young women. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'll approach it with two sort of points. I think one, um, we talked a lot about, you know, women in tech related field and the use of technology. And I think COVID-19 sort of has opened that debate more openly, which has created space. Uh, and I think a lot of work has moved into that. I mean, I started my career as an investment banker and, uh, you know, I, I have no qualms in committing that at that time it was more or less seen in the UK as a, as a boys club job, right? Because there was certain other, and I've actually sat in recruitment committees as well, where we were given specific instructions to downgrade some female candidates because of the limitations they would be, the, the HR committee would perceive they would have while performing in an intense investment banking environment. But I think COVID has really changed that scenario where a lot of my friends are now actually uh, very senior investment bankers, but working from home on transactions and deals. So that, you know, the, the control space and the control environment that I talked about earlier, which actually make women perform better. Uh, I think this COVID has really opened up that, uh, that debate. And I think one should really capture on that opportunity. 
positively, you know, working with the Punjab Tifta, we we are now working with Facebook, and actually Facebook is uh, has opened up an opportunity for about to train thirty thousand uh, young uh, people. Most of them are actually women in in these specific uh, digi skills, which would actually you know create that space for women. But the other part is also, you know, when we talk about a supply driven approach, if you look at Pakistan numbers, we really don't have an approach in skills, right? So we have over 20 million idle youth in Pakistan. We only have about a capacity or uh, to train around 400,000 if we sort of, you know, include all sorts of uh, sort of trainings in, in, in that. So if you compare the two numbers, uh, it, it doesn't really make a, a case of a supply driven or a demand driven approach because the mm -hmm. gap is gap for you. But the issue is not uh, only that, uh, it's also an understanding of the demand. Even when you work with industry, they're not really clear in terms of what their needs are going to be. Because remember, when you talk about skills, it's not an immediate investment, it's an investment over a longer time period, because it's not like general education where you can set up two classrooms, get a good teacher and start. It requires a lot of capex investment as well and physical investment as well. So decisions have to be slightly longer term. Uh, the other other part is also, you know, when we even talk about our industry, you know, I've done a lot of work on uh, premature deindustrialization. I've also worked with Fessel on a few sectors as well, uh, which means that, you know, even within industry skills has not been a, a binding constraint. So because it has not been a binding constraint, the industry does not really want to pay for it. So, you know, they'll, they'll take it if it is given for free, but otherwise, you know, they're not really bothered with a with few exceptions. But what, um, you know, apart from COVID and digi skills, the other area, what we need to see is um, and understand is that, you know, more traditional industrial sectors, we've already missed the boat, right? So we have a few generations behind where the world frontier is and having that sort of growth or having that sort of skills is not really, uh, you know, it, it'll require a lot of effort and a jump start. But what are other things where we can quickly move in, you know? So what are future areas of work? So some interesting ones are we're working on an electric, electric, vehicle policy. Now that offers a lot of opportunity because the fuel base of uh, car automobiles are changing, which means a lot of it will move from mechanical science to technical uh, IT based science, right? So that is the reason why some of very big car manufacturers are worried about uh, Google or worried about Microsoft or worried about Apple because once they move into, uh, you know, AI based and machine learning based vehicles, they're they going to lag on. Now, those are the areas where at least academically, we have already uh, some capabilities that exist. And those are areas which do not really require a lot of physical activity. And it, it, it can really create, uh, you know, at a higher end, a lot of opportunities uh, for women. Similarly, at broad spectrum, you know, climate is a very big area for us. Uh, it's a very big challenge for us as well as compared to other, other countries. And climate opens a lot of um, social entrepreneurship opportunities, uh, you know, which are equally uh, uh, available for, for males as well as for, for, you know, for women as well. So similarly, you know, analytics, uh, data technology, so all of these sectors, which are sectors of, of future uh, is where, you know, we do not really lag behind because these, these are still new sectors to the world as well. So maybe just not only concentrating on the traditional ones, but start to creating a workforce, which sort of responds to the needs of these future sectors really sort of, uh, you know, can, can pick it up. In terms of quickly on policies sort of options, I think uh, one, uh, we need to really start investing in capabilities, you know, uh, Fessel heads the, the education school where the main, uh, at, at LUMS, where the main prime objective is of lifelong skills, right? So skills is not just one off, it has to be a continuous process and it, there has to be a reskilling uh, and upskilling of, of, uh, of whether it is women or, or males, if you have to have a, a, a you know, a, a continuous trajectory on that. Similarly, you know, we need to invest in institutions of work, uh, you know, whether it is government, whether it is private sector, so that needs to grow. And then also, you know, uh, talking about SDGs, decent and sustainable work. Now, one last point, which I really wanted to um, sort of flesh out, given this is Women's Summit, and we have good participation from some uh, very uh, strong women who's, who talk about gender issues. I think one of the places where in policy making we go wrong is we mix discrimination and exploitation. And that sort of convolutes the debate on policy. So, you know, we need to be very clear where we're talking about exploitation of women and where we're talking about discrimination of women, because both of them would actually require a differential policy stance. But if we club the two together, you know, then it creates a problem. And, you know, that, that's where the policy sort of uh, slides out. Uh, slides out. Uh, I'll just stop there. I think running out of time. Okay. Thank you, Swan. Um, uh, 
uh, Shamim and, like, and Faisal Saab, we'll just try to wind it up in the last two questions. So Shamim, uh, we have seen that global markets have evolved and we are looking at uh, enablers for women in tech. But where, how do you see the future of women's work in Pakistan? And how can, like as Usman said, that you know policymakers and everybody needs to come together to ensure that the future of women's work is productive and and safe. So, what will you will your closing comment be on that? Right. So, um, just going back, to, uh, and I'll try to finish mine in the next four minutes, hopefully. Uh, just going back to what Usman was saying about industry demands, and because um, I do represent the tech industry here, um, maybe we are not very clear on the demands, but we have been trying to basically um, hit the hit the nail. However, uh, recently, Pasha has been working in close uh, coordination with the government and academia, so uh, to to identify the demands. If I tell you numbers, at this time, the industry has professionals, say around 125,000 professionals in the technology domain. Every year, we need at least 12,500 skilled labor in, in the domain. And that those can be men and women. It doesn't, it's regardless of, of, of the fact. And for that, we have been working, we have actually basically presented a um, policy paper to the HEC very recently uh, to work towards skill development of students, uh, especially third year and fourth year um, in their seventh, who are in their seventh or eighth semester or sixth semesters. Uh, to be able to work on te uh, uh, technology tracks, especially um, the ones that we came up after a survey uh, within uh, Pasha member companies, which is Mean and Mern, Software Quality Assurance, Agile Methodologies, Native Mobile Applications, AWS and Azure, AI and IoT, Emerging Technologies. Osman, you already mentioned a lot about emerging technologies very uh, correctly. And then again, cyber securities. Now, the, all these are areas where women can explicitly um, you know, play, uh, play a role, uh, definitely. So um, uh, then coming back to your uh, final question about how we can make, uh, you know, um, ensure that government policies and private sectors work together. Uh, one of the things that we are working uh, very closely with the government is we are trying to come up with a policy recommendation around diversity. Now, this is the first of a kind. Uh, we're basically working on a diversity framework, uh, best practices framework. Um, we have been interviewing players in the local market as well as in the global market, uh, especially uh, in uh, you know, companies where diversity ratio is high and companies where diversity ratio is poor to understand what they've done right and what they've done wrong, and which is why we're coming up with a list. So some of the things, obviously, um, again, I think it's, it's at the top of our head, all of us, to have a more yeah. safer environment for women, like giving them a work from home opportunities, like giving them daycare centers, you know, um, uh, easy commute, uh, flexible hours, giving them maternity and paternity leaves. At the end of the day, making sure that uh, the other employees in the company are not biased towards them. They have good mentorship because, again, uh, like we identified throughout this session, mentorship for women. already talked about the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mentorship, the women, mentorship opportunities there. Absolutely. It's more important than it is for the men, uh, given the cultural, uh, you know, uh, bindings that women come from, right, from when they grow up. So all, all those, and then with, with the government or uh, uh, the companies themselves. Uh, so one of the things that we are trying to do is we we would, uh, if the government could pro could provide sort of like incentives for companies with higher with a higher diversity ratio. Say, for, for instance, if companies have a 15% diversity slab, then, you know, maybe a tax cut on their uh, returns or something like that mm. that would actually uh, you know so help raise good, yeah. absolutely yeah yeah, thank you, Shamim, and thank you to Usman, um, Shamim, and Faisal Saab for this really insightful discussion because it is actually if you really need economic empowerment, you need to skill women, but you also need to have those uh, enabling environments policy wise and otherwise in the private sector in academia to be for uh, women to actually be able to succeed. Uh, I would really want to thank uh, Ms. Uzma Kardar of the Gender Mainstreaming Committee Punjab Assembly for actually uh, having this, I mean, making sure that we are all heard in this women's summit. And then Shirkat Ka, of course, the UN Women, World Bank, and Canadian High Commission who's been our partners. Uh, Faisal Saab, one or two lines on your last statement on how do you think we can actually, you know, successive governments doing things and then new governments coming in and doing more new things. How do we sustain these efforts? So um, I just want to go back to what Usman was saying and just complete that thought. My, my 
ये जो स्किल्स वाले एरिया है ना इसमें कंटिन्यूस प्रोफेशनल डेवलपमेंट की तरफ हमें बहुत ज्यादा जाना पड़ेगा विच एसेंशियली मीन्स की ट्रेनिंग जो है वो कंटिन्यूस हो और वो फिट हो करियर पाथ्स में दूसरा वो उसके रिफ्रेश वगैरह कॉन्स्टेंटली आते रहे और तीसरा जो वर्क इन्वायरमेंट है उसके साथ उसका मैच हमें बहुत ज्यादा देखना पड़ेगा दिस इज माई एक्सपीरियंस फ्रॉम वर्किंग विद टीचर्स ऑल्सो कि एक या दो दफा तीन दफा करने से बात नहीं बनी इट्स लाइफ लॉन्ग लर्निंग और यही हमारे स्टूडेंट साइड से भी जो चीजें लेसन आते हैं उसमें जस्ट वन सेंटेंस मोर दिस गोज बैक टू समथिंग जो जापानी में उसे मुझे अब सही उसका प्रोनाशिएशन नहीं आता लेकिन वो शकुन इन कटागी यानी आर्टिजनल स्पिरिट जो है ना वो कहलाता है विच इज वॉट यू इनकल केट ओवर अ फेयर दी लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम एंड दैट्स नॉट जस्ट द वर्क एंड दी स्किल बट ऑल्सो दी एटीट्यूड टू वर्ड्स वर्क एंड स्किल आई थिंक जो हमारी स्किल्स ट्रेनिंग में वो साइड जो है ना वो इस वक्त बहुत मिसिंग है जिसकी वजह से स्किल्स का लफ्ज जो है लोग समझते हैं कि वो इज सम वॉट लोअर देन एजुकेशन एंड अदर थिंग्स डेट वी डू आई स्टॉप देर थैंक यू एवरी वन थैंक यू